So next Sunday afternoon, next Sunday afternoon, 76,000 people are going to crowd into Mile High Stadium to watch the Denver Broncos loot, I mean, take on the Kansas City Chiefs. Take on the Kansas City Chiefs, right? 76,000 people are going to crowd in to the Denver Broncos stadium. 76,000 to watch the game in the crowd. But there's going to be a smaller group of people there of just 53 people. And that's going to be the Denver Broncos players, right? And so if you've got 76,000 people in the crowd to watch the game and 53 people there, 53 people there to actually play the game, how do you know the difference between these two groups? Well, you're not going to be able to tell the difference by what they're wearing because you can go to the pro shop and for just a measly $175, you can buy a replica orange and navy jersey that's the exact same thing as the players are wearing on the field. And you won't be able to tell the difference between these two groups, the the players and and the fans in the crowd, by by what they're saying when they go in. They're going to be saying, hey, you know, go Broncos. And you're not going to be able to tell the difference between the crowd and the, 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 the players by how big they are necessarily. I mean, we've all been watching a game and we've seen that, you know, that Denver Broncos super fan who wears the barrel and only the barrel, right? You can't unsee that. So you can't tell a difference there. So how can you tell the difference? You've got 76,000 people in this crowd, but then you've got 53 people actually playing the game. How can you tell the difference? We're in a message series right now on discipleship and what it means to be a disciple. And last week, we took a look at this thing in the Gospels, this dynamic in the Gospels where you see The gospel writers contrasting the large crowds that followed Jesus around. These large crowds that were casually interested in him, that were interested in him, that were were curious about him, that wanted something out of him but had not committed to him, not sacrificed for him. And contrasted that to the disciples, a very smaller group, 12 main disciples, a couple hundred disciples around that, that were committed, that had given everything to Jesus. This big crowd, like the crowd of fans, the 76,000, and then, you know, those that were actually participating, just like the players in the game. And we looked at this dynamic, and we identified a, a, a problem that often the people in the crowd, just like if you were to confuse a fan that showed up in a jersey to the game to be a player. We, we identified this problem, that there's this problem that we can confuse spiritual crowd members, people who are casually interested in faith, with people who are committed and, and, and have given everything to be a disciple and truly have made Jesus the center of their lives, right? And so we've been asking this question, what is the difference then? How can you tell a difference? What are the marks? How can you tell a difference between people who are casual crowd members and people who are true disciples? How can you tell that difference between these two groups? Because if we want to be a disciple, of course, we want to know the difference. We want to know the difference of how does your life look different between just being a casual crowd member and being being a sold out, everything in, true disciple of Jesus. What are the differences? Well, there are some marks of what it means to be a disciple that kind of seem intuitive, that you kind of just assume and are true. Of course, a disciple believes in Jesus, right? John 2, 11, his disciples believed in him. Of course, a disciple is becoming like Jesus. This is what it meant to be a disciple in the first century. A disciple would choose a rabbi, and then they would try to imitate everything in their life, become like their rabbi, Romans 8, 29, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Of course, the disciple also loves God and loves other people, particularly other disciples. John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And of course, the disciple follows Jesus. This was his call to his first disciples, come follow me. Matthew 4, 19, come follow me. Matthew 9, 9, follow me, he told them, and Matthew got up and followed him. So kind of some of the basics that you would, you would assume maybe that are almost intuitive is that, of course, a true disciple of Jesus is someone who, who believes in Jesus, who is becoming like Jesus, who loves God and loves others and follow, follows Jesus. Without these four things, these are, these are keys, right? You can't become a true disciple without belief, without loving God. 
Right? You're not a true disciple unless you're following Jesus. These things are, are true of all disciples. They're, they're, they're what it means to be a disciple. But if we're asking, you know, how can we tell a difference, the tricky thing is that there's some people over here in the crowd who would go, yeah, I, be I believe in God, right? Oh, yeah, I want to love other people. I want to love God. There's some of these things that, though there are keys to and requirements for being a disciple, that uh, people in the crowd might be able to confuse and identify with. So how can we really distinguish if we're true disciples or just part of the crowd? Well, there are some statements that are particularly challenging that Jesus gives in the Gospels, where he approaches it like, if you are a disciple, then you will. And these are challenging things. They're not just, do you believe? Do you think you believe? They're not just, do you want to love? No, they're challenging things that you can really look at in your life and go, is this the way I'm living? Am I living in these challenges? Am I living in these marks in a way that distinguishes my life from the life of a casual crowd member? And so today what we want to do is we want to look at five of these times that Jesus talked about these marks and these differences between a casual crowd member and a true disciple that were really particularly challenging and can help us draw this distinction between these two groups so we can know if we're living a life of a casual crowd member or a true disciple. And this way we can help ourselves do what we're trying to do in this message series, which is define and understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So the first challenging mark of a disciple, the first challenging mark of a true disciple of Jesus is self-denial, self-denial. A disciple evaluates their own desires and their own inclinations and their own wants and dreams that they take those and all those desires that are in line with the gospel, that are in line with scripture, are in living in the way of Jesus, they pursue those. But in, any of those desires and wants and, and, and dreams and cravings in life that are in conflict with Jesus, they're in conflict with the way of Christ, they're in conflict with scripture, they deny. This is what self-denial means. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, all that self-denial can say is, he leads the way, keep close to him. This was a clear test. If you want to say, okay, what did Jesus, what were the differences Jesus drew out between the crowds and the disciples? This is a clear if-then test that Jesus gave. He said, Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So if you are a disciple then you're participating in this thing called self-denial. Now, self-denial isn't a huge uh, popular thing today, is it, right? In our culture today, it's actually seen as a vice because our culture falsely equates self-denial with self-imprisonment. Assuming that any craving I have, any desire that's in my heart, anything that I, I, I want, well, that must be healthy, that must be good, and pursuing it must give me freedom. It must be a part of my true self. So we've mistakenly come to see self-denial as a way of restricting one's own freedom. As a result, our culture now sees the fulfillment of a person's every de desire, everything that runs through our heart of, oh, I want that thing, or I like that thing, or I want to do this thing. We see the restriction of any desire as restricting human freedom. And expressing any desire, fulfilling any desire we have, no matter how fleeting or sinful, we see that as the expression of human freedom and self. But in reality, this lack of self-denial, this running after every desire is not a form of freedom, but of self-oppression as we are then enslaved to any impulse that we have. Much of what our culture currently terms as self-care or, or self-love is then actually self-absorption. But self-denial teaches a person to pursue satisfaction in God instead of self. A disciple of Jesus specifically says no to some of these impulses and cravings that come to your mind, that, 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 that you want, so you can say yes to Jesus. And of course, it is only in Jesus, not our own desires, that we'll find satisfaction, that we find our true self, that we find the freedom that we want. But to get there, we must practice self-denial. So if you are a true disciple, you're someone who is practicing self-denial. 
Second challenging mark of a disciple is obedience. Jesus gave this clear test, this clear test in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We read this a lot, right? Great commission. And then what does he say? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So a disciple obeys, right? Jesus also told his disciples things like this. John 8, 31. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then he said in John 14, 15. If you love me, Keep my commands. So if you are a true disciple, you'll be someone who is striving after a life of obedience to Jesus, striving after a life where you're trying to obey Scripture and the way in which it tells us to live. But today, research tells us that even most people who would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, even most people who, 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 who would identify themselves as Christians disagree with Scripture on basic things like Marriage and church and sexuality and money and, and, and more. And how can that, how in the world can that be? Like, that should be the most weird statistical finding ever. Well, it's because in the crowd, you disobey. You disobey. Crowd members are marked by disobedience, but disciples are marked by obedience. But what, what role does obedience really play in, in our life? Well, it's kind of like this ring. So usually I wear these black rubber wing, rings because this is actually hard to get off. Um, so I, this is my original ring that I got when I married Megan 16 years ago. It's this white gold ring, right? And I, I don't know a lot about gold and what is or isn't gold. I think you, you bite this or something like that. Did I don't know, right? But I know that there are some rings that aren't real gold, and I know that because my, my girls like to use their quarters at the King Supers to get fake jewelry out of those little, little machines and so I know not every ring is real gold, but the way I best know that this ring is gold is right on the inside of it. There's a little stamp that says 14K, right? 14 carat. And so there's a stamp on it that's saying that this ring is 14 carat gold, that it's real, authentic, genuine gold. So does that stamp, does that stamp make this ring gold? No, it doesn't, right? I could, take a stamp, I could take a Sharpie and write on some of my kids' costume jewelry, 14K. It doesn't, make it, it doesn't make it real gold, right? So the stamp doesn't make it gold. But the stamp is the best way that I know how to determine if this is genuine gold. Does that make sense? In the same way, our obedience to God is like this ring and that stamp. Our obedience to God, our actions, our obedience, it isn't what makes us saved disciples of Jesus. The only way to find salvation now and forever is faith through God's grace given to us on the cross and the empty tomb. That's it. That's the only way. So our obedience does not make us disciples. However, like this stamp, obedience is the best way that we know how to tell if our faith is genuine, if our discipleship is authentic. Of course, disciples still mess up. <laughs> if you mess, I, I, mess up every, I mess up every day, right? We still mess up, but we're striving for, our goal is obedience. As Bonhoeffer eloquently put it, only he who believes is obedient and only he who is obedient believes. So one of the challenging differences between a disciple and someone still standing in the crowd is, are you striving for Obedience. Are you striving for a life that obeys the ways of Christ? Third challenging mark of a disciple is suffering. Suffering. This is the super popular one, <laughs> right? But it is. It's a mark of, of true discipleship it is suffering. At home in my library, I have four of almost the identical same book on one of my back shelves. I don't know if you've seen these before. It says God's Promises. Have you seen these? Now, I don't know how I own these books. I haven't bought one of them. My, my leading theory is that they magically materialize because there must be some universal law that pastors have to own at least three. I don't know, right? But they're full of all these little promises of, that God makes in Scripture. And the idea of the book is that you kind of like turn to a different page, that something you're struggling with, that it encourages you, right? 
But I, whenever I see these books in my library, I always laugh because they would never, ever put this one particular promise that God makes us on the front page because they would sell zero copies. Here it is, 2 Timothy 3.12. Everyone who wants to, wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Yeah, if you, if you put that on the front of the God's Promises book, it's not going to sell, right? Very similarly, Philippians 1.29, and has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. John 16.33 very bluntly adds, in this world you will have trouble. I know, don't get too excited, okay, you know? But this is it's just a reality. Jesus is saying, okay, if you're a true disciple, if you really believe, you can have persecution, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be hardship, there's going to be trouble. There just is. Why do Jesus' disciples suffer? Well, of course, we're in a fallen world and we all have suffering. But also because when you're a disciple, you're a part of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is in war with the kingdom of this world, Right? And so if you're on the other side from the ways of this world, well, you will face opposition. You will face persecution. But if you don't face opposition, if you don't face persecution, if you face no hardship, no sacrifice for your faith, if there's no challenge given because of your faith, if there's no suffering from the world, well, then maybe it's because your real allegiance is with the world. So why would it be against you? So, of course, the world is against us. Now, on the, on the surface level, not a great sales pitch, right? This isn't usually what we lead with, you know? <laughs> you want to be a disciple of Jesus? You'll suffer. It's really great, right? And this is why even some of the, 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 the biggest churches in our countries teach something called the prosperity gospel, which is the false claim that, hey, if you just, you know, have faith, you'll be healthy and you'll be wealthy and you'll avoid suffering. Won't it be nice? But it's a lie. That is a lie for the crowds. As Martin Luther argued, they gave our master a crown of thorns. Why do we hope for a crown of roses? They gave our master a crown of thorns. Why do we hope for a crown of roses? And if you push past that surface level, if you push past that surface level, you'll find that suffering does bring unexpected rewards. Yes, Jesus promises a reward in heaven for the suffering we experience here on earth for him. Yes, we know we're re rewarded with that tough one character growth. But the greatest reward of suffering is experiencing God more. So one of the promises, although it's challenging, although it's not the bumper sticker sales pitch of being a disciple, one of the differences between the crowd is there is suffering. The fourth challenging mark of a true disciple is authority transfer. Authority transfer. So in the first century, this, this was really obvious in what it meant to be a disciple and a rabbi. The, the, the disciple rabbi norm and relationship was established long before Jesus was using it with his disciples. And when a disciple became a disciple of a particular rabbi, they gave up their own authority. They transferred it to their rabbi. And so if the rabbi had a particular way of teaching, if the rabbi had a particular interpretation of scripture, if the rabbi had a particular way he said, this is the best way to live, well, then the disciple just believed that. It wasn't up to them, right? They just took on that view. To claim you were a disciple of a certain rabbi, but to disagree with them, to, to, to reject the authority of your rabbi, just meant they weren't your rabbi, and you weren't the disciple. Discipleship required you to submit, to submit to your rabbi and choose them instead of you as the authority over your life. I love how Pastor Tony Evans puts this type of submission. He says this, the process of discipleship is the process of authority transfer. The process of discipleship is the process of authority transfer. But there really isn't a more dirty word probably in our society than submit, right? Those in the crowd can't submit to God because they want authority in their own life. 
They may be interested in Jesus, but they won't submit to him. They won't transfer the right to make decisions in their life to Christ. Crowd members retain their own life authority. But a true disciple submits. They actually transfer the authority to make decisions of what's right and wrong and and how to live to Jesus from themselves. So can you submit? Can we submit our bank account, our career, our worldviews? Can we submit our beliefs? Can we submit our values? Can we submit our family? Can we submit our life routines? Can we submit those things to Jesus? Can we actually transfer that authority? James 4, 7 tells us, submit yourselves then to God. And if you track through the Gospels, you'll hear hear Jesus over and over and over again referred to as Lord. What what does that mean? It's, it's, It's the one with authority. You'll you'll hear him called king, king of kings. What does that mean? Well, it's the one with authority. So one of the distinctions between a a casual crowd member and and, and an actual true disciple is that a disciple is willing to transfer that authority. Transfer authority, say, authority of my life doesn't rest with me. It's going to rest with God and his word. The fifth challenging mark of a disciple is bearing fruit. Jesus made this, this, this test very clear. Not long before Jesus headed to the cross, he told his disciples in John 15, 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So if you're a disciple, right? If you're a disciple, then you will bear fruit. Not like you might bear fruit or you could bear fruit, but you will bear fruit. Disciples bear fruit. You can know that you're a disciple, one of the ways, the distinctions between a true disciple and a crowd member is if you bear fruit. So what, is, what did Jesus mean when he was saying bear fruit? What, is that, what does that idiom mean? Well, bearing fruit has a lot, like, think of a fruit tree, right? So when we moved into our house a while back, we had a fruit tree. We had a little pear tree in the front yard that had never been taken care of by the previous owners of the house. And so for years, I waited for it to produce a pear, nothing, right? Year after year, no pears. And so for a couple years, I was like, I'm going to get this thing in order. But it was, it was a mess. Like, think a Charlie Brown tree, but a pear, pear tree and more dead, right? And so this thing, it just wasn't producing. So for a couple of years, like two, three years, I'd water it and I would prune it, which I don't know what I'm doing, but I tried, right? So I give it all this effort. And for all that effort, after two or three years, I got three rock hard, inedible pears. So then I, uh, I chopped it down. Very satisfying. Because <laughs> all that matters with a fruit tree is what it produces, Right? To bear fruit is the end result. It's the concrete result that you can hold in your hand. For that tree, it should have been the pear, and I'm still bitter. I need pears. I like pears. Bearing fruit, in the same way, bearing fruit is that end result. When Jesus says bear fruit, he's talking about that concrete end result, the observable result of your faith. Now, we confuse this a lot today, so to be clear, Jesus is not in talking about what you intended to happen. He's not talking about your intentions. He's not talking about what you felt like should have happened. He's not talking about your feelings. He's not talking about what you wish would have occurred or what you wish you would have done. He's not talking about your wishes. He's talking about the actual concrete result, the observable result of your faith, the observable results of your life. Are your actions actually different from your neighbors? Like, is there a concrete difference? Is there a difference there? Can, can you name who those people are that, 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 that you've made disciples or you're, you're helping grow someone else in their faith and discipleship? Is there a difference? Are you sharing your faith? Can you say, hey, here's the result. I've, I've, I have shared the gospel with these, these people these last few years, Right? Is there character change happening? Could someone observe a sacrifice that you're making for your faith? What is the end result in your faith? Because bearing fruit is how you can know if you're a true disciple. It's one of the ways that you can tell this difference between whether your life looks more like a casual crowd member or more like a true disciple is if you are bearing fruit. What is the end result? Is there a difference in your faith? Is there a difference in your life? You kind of think of it like this. Imagine that tomorrow you get arrested for for being a Christian, okay? And so you go to trial, 
and there's a judge and lawyers and the jury and all those things. Would there be enough evidence as you take the stand to convict you of being a disciple of Jesus? That's what Jesus is getting at with bearing fruit. The actual observable evidence, the actual observable results. A true disciple of Jesus bears fruit. So back to our original question. How can you tell this difference? There's these two groups. How can you tell the difference of if you're living life as a, 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 casual, a casual crowd member or if you're living life as this true disciple of Jesus? And yes, absolutely. A disciple believes in Jesus, is becoming like Jesus, loves God, loves others, and follows Jesus. Those things are absolute requirements. But there's these also these, these handful of, of challenging marks in a disciple's life. Challenging things because, you know, it's, it's challenging to live a life of self-denial. Particularly, particularly in a culture that says, hey, if, you, if it feels good to you, it feels good. Right? It, it's, hard, it's hard to live a life of self-denial. It's hard to live a life of becoming like Jesus. It's hard to live a life of obedience, of suffering, of authority transfer. It's hard to live a life of bearing fruit. Those things are challenging, right? They're not easy. You don't just wake up and do them all perfectly in one day. And on the surface level, they're not the greatest sales pitch ever for faith, are they? Because those things, I mean, self-denial, obedience, transferring the authority, these things are asking everything of you. They're saying that faith is something you give everything to. That faith isn't a part-time thing. It's a full-time thing that you give everything to Jesus. Discipleship will cost you everything, so why be a disciple? What's the benefit? Why was it so enticing to those first disciples that they gave their life for it, that they gave everything for it, that they died for it? Why be a disciple? Well, there's a deeper truth on a deeper level of why to be a disciple. And yeah, discipleship will ask everything of you, but it'll also give you the one thing that your heart is asking for. There's this beautiful part, uh, story in, in Mark chapter six. So Mark chapter six, Jesus is right in the thick of his ministry. And he's got those 12 closest disciples, right? And he sends them out. So they go out and they spend these, all these days out in the world and they're preaching repentance and they're telling people about Jesus and they're casting out demons, which is wild, and they're healing people. And, and so they've done all this stuff and they're exhausted. And, and so they come back to Jesus and they're trying to fill him in and be like, oh man, we went to this town and we cast out this demon. There is this person who couldn't walk. And we, they're, they're trying to fill him in on everything they did and they keep getting interrupted because there's this crowd that's just pushing in on them, right? And so Jesus is trying to spend time with his disciples, but instead there's this crowd that's pushing in. And there's this crowd that's, man, they're, they're, they're interested and curious about Jesus, but they have not committed to him yet, right? It's this casual crowd and it's thousands of people. It's all these people and they want to be around Jesus and they want something from him. They want a healing. They want to be entertained. Oh, but they're not ready to sacrifice for him, right? So there's this crowd and they're interrupting Jesus and the disciples and they're so frantic that the disciples haven't even been able to sit down and eat a meal yet. And so we read in Mark 6, 31, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He, Jesus, said to them, come with me, come with me, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Come be with me. So yeah, Jesus, he asked them for everything. When they became disciples, he said, come follow me. You're gonna have to give up everything in your life. Come follow me. And they did. They gave it all up. And from this moment, years later, each one, one by one, would be put to death for their faith. They gave up everything. Why in the world would they do that? There certainly wasn't for money or status or health or wealth. It was none of that. They gave up all of that. They gave up their own lives for him. So why in the world was it so enticing? Why was it so life-giving? Why was the deepest desire of their heart to become a disciple of Jesus? It's because Jesus turned them to them and he said, come be with me. Come be with me. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's gonna take self-denial. It's gonna take obedience. It's gonna take giving up the authority in your life. It's a challenge. It, it absolutely is but you're gonna get more of Christ. 
And that's what your heart truly desires. A disciple gets to be with Jesus. You to be with Jesus. In this life, that means that, that the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. Speaking and living, and it, that's God himself. God himself living within you. And it means that he will be with you always. And yes, that promise means that for the disciple in the next life, you'll be always with Jesus forever. So yeah, discipleship, it is challenging. Man, these, these marks of a disciple that make us distinct from a casual, casual crowd member, man, they're it's, it's not a joke, they're challenging. Oh, oh, but the benefit is you get to be with Jesus. Jesus turns to you and says, come and be with me. So yes, discipleship will ask everything of you, but you will be given the one thing that your heart is asking for. You see, the crowd members, the crowd members, they think they're going to be satisfied by surface level things. They think they're going to be satisfied with, if they just have more stuff, more possessions, more money, more status. And the thing about more and more of that stuff is the more and more you get, the more obvious it is that you've got a hole in your soul. And you never satisfy. You, there is never enough. And it just shows more and more that your heart has this hole in it that isn't filled by that stuff. And that you can't fill it by just simply, simply staying over here as a casual fan of Jesus, as a crowd member. Blaise Pascal once said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. Meaning, the only thing that is actually gonna satisfy you is God himself. It's God himself. And that's what your heart truly desires. That's what you really want and need in life. And so, yeah, there, it's challenging to be a true disciple. Jesus pulled no punches. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He didn't say it was going to be a cakewalk. He didn't say you were going to get healthy and wealthy and fame. No, none of that. It is a challenge. Self-denial and obedience. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Transferring authority, bearing fruit, it's a challenge. But that challenge will result in you getting the one thing you really want. Yes, yes, discipleship will ask you to give everything. But it's so your heart can be given the one thing it's asking for.